Hello. Uh, last week, Rishi Sunak uh, surprised Westminster by bringing back David Cameron, the ex-Prime Minister, as his Foreign Secretary. Uh, and indeed, it may turn out to be a very successful experiment. After all, uh, David Cameron has both the experience and the authority of having, a prime, uh, having been a Prime Minister, and he'll bring that to being a Foreign Secretary. But one of the first things he did when addressing the backbench committee of Conservative MPs, the so-called 22 committee, was to talk about how he'd handled the European Court uh, over the prisoner votes issue as a demonstration of how strong he was uh, in dealing with Europe. Now, everybody can have rose-tinted memories of what they've done in the past, and nobody normally cares about that. But on this occasion, uh, it does have implications for what's coming next. Those who misremember the past can miscalculate the future. And in the next six months to a year, we're going to be having dealings with uh, international courts, the International Court of Human Rights, our own courts, and of course, international law over our immigration policy, most particularly over Rwanda. So it's very important we remember uh, exactly what led us to succeed in dealing with the European Court when we dealt with prisoner votes. It makes me physically ill to even contemplate having to give the vote to anyone who is in prison. Frankly, when people commit a crime and they go to prison, they should lose their rights, including the right to vote. But we are in a situation that, again, I'm afraid we have to deal with. This is costing us, potentially, £160 million. So we have to come forward with proposals, because I don't want us to spend that money. It's not right. So painful as it is, we've got to sort out yet another problem that was just left to us by the last government. Later that week, I was on Question Time, a television programme, and I challenged that interpretation. In essence, it did not seem to me that Mr Cameron, or indeed the uh, the government, the British government, uh, needed to accede to the European Court, and there were ways of dealing with it, as you'll see. Should prisoners be allowed the vote, which uh, uh, is uh, what... Um... The Prime Minister said it's going to happen, it's going to be introduced. David Davis, you start on that. No, it's a simple answer. They, uh, they committed a crime. When you go to prison, you give up a number of your civil rights, the most obvious one, your liberty, <clears throat> but also other ones as well. Uh, I have to say, I mean, there are many times when I can applaud the actions of the European Court of Human Rights, but this is not one of them. This is actually none of their business. They said in the judgment that one of the reasons they made this decision was because there had been no debate in Parliament. Well, maybe they didn't go back to 1867. Um, maybe they didn't realise there was a democracy here then, but that's when it was debated, uh, and we made a decision. Now, frankly, if I were the government today, I would take a rather tougher line than they have done. I would actually offer Parliament three options. I'd say, here you are, you can either uh, give prisoners the vote, which appears to be what the ECHR want, or you can give some prisoners the vote to those who are only uh, sent down for uh, uh, six months or a year, something like that, or you can vote to uh, disagree with the ECHR. And then let's see the ECHR overturn the decision of a democratic uh, body like Parliament. That's what I would do. Very simple, say no. So the Prime Minister... Prime Minister's wrong to say in the House no, of Commons, I, mean, I had no alternative, I will, uh, grit he, my teeth, but I have to do it. He will have been advised that he has to follow this by the, but, by the, go, has, by the but, government but, lawyers. But the simple truth but he is, doesn't, you're what, what, he doesn't. Should, what should have happened, those government lawyers should look much more carefully at what was said in the judgment. It was, they, they, they majored very much on this issue of not being a vote in Parliament. Let's give them a vote in Parliament. And, uh, yeah. After the Prime Minister had made that statement in the House, uh, saying he was going to acquiesce to the European Court of human rights on this matter, uh, on prisoner votes, I decided to bring a motion to the House to get the House of Commons to vote on this uh, so that we could, frankly, overturn the uh, instruction of the European Court uh, and tell the government not to obey it. Now, to do that, I struck up an alliance with Jack Straw. Jack Straw had been a Justice Secretary. He'd been a whole series. He'd been Foreign Secretary. And also, he'd taken through the Human Rights Act through the uh, House of Commons, the very thing that brought uh, European court measures into law. So he knew full well uh, exactly uh, how we could cope with this. And indeed, he also knew, as I did, that the court was overstepping its powers. Uh, so what we did was we applied to the relevant committee to get a motion, to get time for a motion in the House. Uh, that was 
uh, reported in the newspapers, as you can see here. And uh, that night, I went to a cocktail party at number 10, and David Cameron, uh, the then Prime Minister, approached me and asked me to withdraw the motion, asked me to drop the motion. Well, uh, I could see no point in that at all. Uh, I'm afraid I was rather brusque with him, and I said, no, I wouldn't, uh, that uh, the Parliament should have a say, and if need be, uh, refuse to obey the European Court, uh, as you and as you will see uh, in the motion itself. There will be many important debates in this slot, but this one I would lay claim is unique because it gives this House, not the government, but this House the right to assert its own right to make a decision on something of very great democratic importance and to take that decision back to itself. I think this House should insist that this is our decision and from this place we will not move. By extending their remit into areas way beyond any original conception of fundamental human rights, the court in Strasbourg is, I suggest, undermining its own legitimacy and its potential effectiveness in respect of the purposes for which it was established. The court had reached beyond its own competence. It tried to do something it wasn't really empowered to do. And many members of the House of Commons spoke that day, and not just him and I, the there were even a future Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab, came back from having his hip uh, fixed in hospital uh, to make a speech. But many, many powerful speeches were made. And the decision was emphatic, 234 votes to 22. An overwhelming majority uh, was against doing what the European Court said. Now, that's incredibly important because this is not an executive saying we don't want to obey the court. It's a parliament, an elected parliament, very difficult for the court to prevail over that, uh, and so very important. And of course, after that had happened, uh, the uh, prime minister uh, suddenly found himself caught between a rock and a hard place, really, and he had to choose which way to go. And quite properly, as you'll hear, he decided to go with parliament. I have always believed that when you are sent to prison, you lose certain rights, and one of those rights is the right to vote. And crucially, I believe this should be a matter for Parliament to decide, not, not a, a foreign court. Parliament has made its decision, and I completely agree with it. The Prime Minister changed his mind quite properly. And uh, what happened next? Well, Jack Straw and I went to see the European Court. Now, both Jack and I are supporters of international law. We've defended the court in the past, both of us. And he, of course, as I said, had carried through the Human Rights Act, which brought European law into British law uh, on, on issues like this. Now, uh, so we weren't enemies of the court. We were there as people who believed in international law. And we told them that they had gone beyond what was proper. And they accepted that, I think, or at least they understood where we were coming from. They may not have agreed with us, but they understood where we were coming from and they understood that where they stood was untenable. And that led to quite a few changes uh, in the, the, the court's approach. Most notably, Ken Clark went to see them and uh, it came out with something called the Brighton Declaration, which was effectively the court saying, we understand we've strayed too far from our original purpose and... Uh, we are going to be uh, more constrained in future in how we interpret human rights law. Now, that, is, that was a big change, and it came about because Parliament drove it, not because an executive drove it. There are plenty of times that governments around Europe uh, uh, disagree with the European Court, but on this occasion, the Parliament had spontaneously said, uh, up with this we will not put, and that's what changed the game. Now, I said at the beginning of this video that those who misremember the past are at risk of miscalculating the future. And this matters because what we're about to go into is a reform of our approach to our immigration policy, uh, fine-tuning it, if you like, uh, the, R the Rwanda policy, to make sure that it meets the considerations of the British courts, the worries of the British courts. Uh, that means rewriting the treaty. It may mean Rwanda rewriting some of their laws. It may mean us fine-tuning some of our laws. Uh, but what is important in this is that we remember the lesson that the courts will be much more cautious about taking on a parliament 
than there will be about taking on a government. And so when we carry that change in law, change in treaty, change in approach through, the, uh, the thing we must have at the front of our minds is that Parliament must have its right uh, to say how it will be done, its right to express its view, its right to vote on all the key issues. So whilst the uh, government will want to do it quickly, quite understandably, it probably take it through as emergency legislation, it should take it through in a way which is quick, but gives time for people to speak, time for people to vote, time for people to consider. Uh, that can be done. And it's important. It, it, it is done. Look, I am... I'm not a great enthusiast for the Rwanda policy, but Parliament has voted very plainly in favour of it. So now we we should implement it. Uh, and it's important. Uh, at the moment, uh, people from many parts of the world are putting their lives in the hands of gangsters, really, of criminals who organise these uh, this, this trafficking of people uh, to the UK. They're putting their lives at risk in a number of ways, most notably um, a risk of drowning in, in, in the channel. As I, uh, as I make this video, uh, some family members were, uh, some members of a family that were trying to cross the channel died off the coast of France a few days ago. Uh, so it's incredibly important, not just for the interests of Britain, and it's very important for us too, because it's uh, making our own uh, voters, our own constituents, feeling that we're not in control of our borders, but also for the interests of the people who may end up drowned in the channel, uh, as has happened too many times throughout Europe, actually, uh, because of these human traffickers. So we've got to get this right this time. And in doing so, we have to harness the power of democratic decision of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. If we do that, we'll win.